Welcome to another episode of the Spoon Mob Podcast. This week I'm joined by sommelier Keegan Kokorin, who is the founder and owner of Ignition Wines, which is a fine wine distributor located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Keegan had like a 20-year career with Jeff Ruby's before and then launched Ignition Wines earlier this year. So we get into the story, the ethos behind it, why he decided to launch Ignition Wines. You know, he was working for Jeff Ruby's and worked his way up through kind of the steakhouse and reached this point as kind of their corporate beverage director where he was running the beverage programs across all their different locations. You know, Nashville, I think they have something in Kentucky, possibly New York too as well. Obviously, Ohio here in Columbus, Cincinnati, where they're based out of too. And he just kind of reached this point within the company where everybody above him whose last name was Ruby. So like there was no other real advancement opportunities for him. And he kind of really had to think, what did I want to do at that point? And he gets into kind of that thought process too, as well. And you know, where you can find all the wines and everything that he's bringing in. So the stuff, obviously at Jeff Ruby, cause he has a great relationship with them, but you can also find some of the wine at jungle gyms and a bunch of different bottle shops and wine retailers across the Cincinnati area. So you can follow him on Instagram at Snap Keegan. Also follow Ignition Wine on there too as well. It's at Ignition Wines. For any news or update um, that comes out with kind of new wines that they're bringing in or new places you can find their wine, all that kind of stuff too as well. Follow us on Instagram too, uh, at Spoon Mob, on all the other social medias, but mainly use Instagram still. That's kind of our primary social media that we do. So we put all new episodes and everything, links to everything through our Instagram. There's uh, links in the link tree and the bio you can find too as well. They're all over the place, but check out our website, spoonmom.com. Different profiles for all of our guests are up there too. Links to all the episodes. So we have a master page for all the episodes. So it's a little bit easier to navigate than if you're going through like a podcast app. And then um, different photos, food photos, wine photos, contact information, all that kind of stuff too in the individual pages. And then make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast, wherever you get your podcast from, Spotify, Apple, Amazon Music, YouTube. We're on all those platforms. You can find us. Make sure to follow. That way, all the new episodes hit straight in your feed. We usually release new episodes Thursdays, 1 a.m. Eastern time, and then they hit YouTube a week later. But no video component. It's audio only, but some people use the YouTube app and everything to consume podcasts, even if they're audio only. That's like their preferred player, especially if you have like kids and you have a YouTube premium subscription anyways. Why pay for something else unless, you know, you have an Apple phone and then Apple podcast is free, but everybody kind of runs in those situations. So a bunch of different places you can find us anywhere, everywhere. If for some reason you can't shoot us a note, email, whatever, we'll take a look, see why we're not on that platform potentially, or if there's an issue with our RSS feed or whatever and get that resolved, but everything should be running smoothly. But without any further delay, here is my conversation with sommelier Keegan Kokorin, who is the founder and owner of Ignition Wines, based out of Cincinnati, Ohio. Cool. Well, thanks again for coming on the podcast. A lot of misconnections between us rescheduling everything, but finally I get to do this. So this will be cool. First stumbled upon, I know you did a tasting event, a Psalm verse Psalm thing, I think at Veritas with Greg Stokes uh, a couple years ago, and then popped up through Instagram with Ignition Wines, which is what you're doing now. So get to that and everything you got going on with that and inspiration and goals and, and everything. But I always like to start at the beginning with everybody. How did you kind of first get involved with wine? Was it just first job through restaurants and you stayed in restaurants or how did all that kind of come together? My involvement in wine and getting into wine was very much by accident. My family was never big wine drinkers. It was never anything that even we had like around like Thanksgiving or anything like that. I don't recall even my aunts and uncles really drinking a lot of wine, although I'm sure it was there. We were more like a light beer and whiskey family. You know, it wasn't until I was finished with college. So initially I went to Purdue University for aerospace engineering. And when I came back to Cincinnati from school, I did not want to do that. And I was kind of, ironically, I was like, you know what? I don't want to, at the time, it's kind of funny. I was, I was looking back at you know my college career and, and all that. And I'm thinking, I don't want to sit in front of a computer all day. And oh, how ironic you know, life has become that that's all any of us really do anymore. I moved back to Cincinnati and I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Kind of was at a crossroads as far as post-adolescence or whatever we want to call it. But uh, I was framing houses as a rough carpenter during the day and I was waiting tables at night, mostly because it was easy. It was quick cash and I was in my early 20s and I just wanted to party and wanted to do anything serious because I really didn't do any of that in college. After a period of time, 
you know, I started off at some lower level restaurants and, and I was glad for the experience. And, and someone suggested that I go work for Jeff Ruby. You know, at the time I was playing a lot of music. I was a drummer in a couple punk bands and, and it was big in the music scene there. And a buddy of mine said, hey, you know, this guy who's going to be the, who's the general manager of one of our restaurants, or one of the Jeff Ruby restaurants, is going to be at our show. You should talk to him about getting a job there. You know, I remember in between points of browning out, walking up to him, just drunk as fuck and be like, hey, I'm a great server. I, you know, I, you should hire me. And I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, man, did that shit happen? Like, did I really just embarrass myself like that? And thankfully, it wasn't too bad as, as much as I remember because he hit me up the next day. He's like, hey, come in an interview. I was like, OK, God, thank God. So I got an interview and, and I went in and I got hired as, on as a server at, at a place called Tropicana. Uh, it used to be on the, the Newport side of, of Cincinnati on the Kentucky side and uh, zero wine experience. I had some some experience in the previous restaurants that I worked at, but none really that kind of garnered any like real education as far as wine. Some sales, but to be honest, at, at that point in my career, because I was so green, just didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. I walked in this one day in the side stand and this is that shortly after I got hired and there was a bunch of servers and they were all swirling glasses and they were pontificating about like the notes of this and the bouquet of that and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, all these people, I'm just like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Like, Cause it was lack of exposure to it. I legitimately didn't know what the hell they were talking about really. And somebody handed me a glass. They just come out of a wine tasting, you know, swirl it around and, and tell us what you smell. And so I started swirling around. I'm like, I don't know. I get, it smells like some Oak and, some dark fruit or something. There's something very, you know, rudimentary, whatever the hell I said. Can't even remember. They're like, yeah, you know, we all exactly said that before you walked into this room. Like we were just saying that and they all kind of agreed. And, and I was like, in that moment, that was, I, I really consider that my light bulb moment because I had stumbled upon this medium that I could then kind of better understand other people, better understand myself, relate to the world a little better. I became interested. I was like, okay, I, I kind of want to learn about this whole wine thing. And it's not just a thing that gets you drunk and, and is uh, ignorable, for lack of a better word, at least my thoughts at the time. And so I just started reading on it. And I discovered that like, oh, cool, you know, I'm a nerd. I like chemistry. I like geology. I like, uh, I like history. I like to do all these other things. And by the way, I'm also, uh, if you and your audience can't already tell, severely ADHD. <laughs> so like my concentration, a lot of the times, you know, it, it, it wanes and ebbs and flows, but uh, from subject to subject. And in wine, I was able to discover this thing that I could never truly get my hands around, but always kept me interested, whether I wanted to learn about the history, whether I wanted to learn about the geology or the chemistry, et cetera. And just, I just started just like burning through books and just started reading and obsessing about it. And it was just something that always lit my hair on fire. So in two 2008, I discovered the W set, which is the Wine Spirit and Education Trust, a, a kind of a formal certification board. I'm sure you're aware of. Did my first two levels with them, and it, it was a really good education because it kind of like further like opened up this door to wine by way of like critical deductive tasting and, and, and etc. Uh, adding a little bit more academics to what I had been doing in a more structured sense. It's a great. Uh, you know, pathway, I think, for people that want to learn uh, through wine. But I was a restaurant guy, right? You know, so one of my friends was like, well, have you heard about the quartermaster sommeliers? I was like, no. And they said, well, it's kind of the same thing or it's similar, uh, similar vein, except it's more, it has like the service bent to it, more application for the restaurant floor. And I'm like, well, that sounds perfect for me because obviously I'm working in restaurants and this is what I want to do. And I really found uh, a career in restaurants. And uh, I went to Indianapolis, got my introductory with the quartermaster sommeliers in 2009 and i sat with that for a couple of years and then didn't re-engage the court in as far as the the next level of certifications until i think 2012 or something like that where i got my certified then started some tasting groups here in cincinnati i was still playing music and whatnot and i didn't necessarily know that you know wine was going to be my thing i knew i loved it but i didn't view it as a career path at that point you know i knew it was Getting certification was was good for me uh, because, you know, I felt obviously there's the communal aspect of it and all the friends I made along the way and whatnot. But certainly in, in an era of applied importance to certifications, it's, it definitely can garner you some street cred or for lack of a better word, or, you know, even help with your employment. So I'm like, OK, I want to get this because it'll help further me in my career and at least while I'm in restaurants. And then I, you know, started some some tasting groups here and 
area, made a lot of great friends, and we grew that, and we started injecting the the Cincinnati area with a, a lot of, and Columbus area too, Columbus and Dayton and some Northern Kentucky of some people that like were in our tasting group, and, and we all just ran through just a bunch of nerds, you know, Saturdays and Sundays, we'd get together, we'd taste through a bunch of bottles, and we'd run through like service scenarios and practice drills and, and all this stuff with the hopes of helping people pass these exams. In 2000, 2016, 2017, I took the advanced uh, exam for the first time. Uh, didn't get through, which is you know normal. It's a very, very hard test. And then in 2018, passed my advanced uh, exam. And then in 2020, we had a little thing go on in the world. I don't know if you if you've heard of it. Not even going to mention its name, but that kind of put uh, the the curriculum uh, on hold as far as testing goes. Uh, and then 2021, I took the master sommelier exam for the first time. Didn't get through. Turns out it's a hard fucking test. And then I just, I sat for it again this past May for the second time. Didn't get through again, but I did much better than I did the first time. At least didn't embarrass myself. But next year I plan to sit again, at least how I got started. With the exams that you've taken, because you started in WSET and then moved to CMS because of the service component. But looking back on your initial experience with kind of those lower levels, the intro, the certifieds, is that a path that you would recommend for upcoming aspiring sommeliers? Like start with WSET and then switch to CMS if you need the service component? Or where do you think people should start if that's something that they wanted to get into? That's a great question. I uh, Everyone has their own paths and I don't want to relegate someone to doing that or doing the Master of Wine program or whatnot. I think it ultimately would require you to do your research and see like how each one of the different organizations can can best fit with your not just your goals but also your personality and what speaks to you as uh insofar as like the academic side of it 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 is an infinite literally an infinite amount of information to try to get a grasp on which is daunting to to everyone inclusive of myself for me i found the pathway of starting with w set and then moving on to the court beneficial just because it was uh, the the way that the 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 tasting portion at least is conducted and is taught kind of better suited at the time my kind of like learning style so to speak and then once i was able to get a grasp on that it made it's kind of hard for me to answer this question too because we're talking about over 10 years ago courts definitely changed i'm sure uh, w set has changed i would assume anyways you know over the course of a decade so it's hard for me to like answer that by way of like, oh, yes, this is, you know, the court is definitely something for, you know, this person or, or, and if you're not in this, then you shouldn't do that. Because I think all of them have something to bring to the table anymore. I, I'm certainly, you know, dedicated to the court of master sommeliers. And I believe uh, in the organization, I believe in, in the way that they do things and the way that I've been taught and in the communal aspect uh, as that was one of the things that like one of the aspects is really solidified for me. The CMS is, is certainly a fellowship. And the friends I've made along the way and, you know, all of the, I guess, shared organized goal of passing a lot of these exams, it, it, it forces people in a very loving way to, to come together and to work towards passing these exams and the, the different levels of those. I didn't experience that with WSET. That's not to say that it doesn't exist. I'm sure it does. It just didn't exist for me at the time. And so that's kind of one of the, my endorsement, at least as far as the CMS is concerned. Uh, it's not a knock on WSET or any of these other programs, if, if that makes sense. With CMS, you know, obviously we've well documented different people that have come on this podcast. That 2018 area, a couple things happen. There's the information or cheating scandal, depending on who wants to label it as what. Also, some people get expelled from the court. So, you know, I usually kind of ask this to people who are involved with that organization around that time. And we've got a bunch of different answers. I don't think there's really a right or wrong answer either. I think it's all applicable to somebody where they're at individually at that time. But when that stuff happens for you, how do you look at it? Because some people are like, I'm done with the organization, never want to be involved with it ever again. They set their stuff back, what have you. There's some people already this far into it. I really just want to finish. I'm going to push through and finish. And then after that, I'm done. Like, don't ask me to do any fundraising events, whatever. And there's some people, you know, wait and see approach, see if there's any actual changes. And some others were like, well, how you actually implement changes from being involved in the organization yourself. So when all that happens, what are your thoughts 
how do you mentally kind of figure out what you're going to do? Because you're at that point advanced, past the advance, and you're looking at sitting for the master for the first time. First and foremost, there isn't a single person uh, in the court, and I'm sure outside of the court, that was not highly disappointed with the events that transpired. Notwithstanding, I am a firm believer that the approach of burn it all to the ground and, and let's let's just raise it and we'll start over or let's abandon this because clearly it's rotten to the core. And blah. I don't then and I certainly don't now uh, believe in that, not just in terms of uh, the, the court in and of itself, but as a life uh, as a life philosophy. I think it's so flawed and short because I, I'm, I'm a believer in positive change. I'm a believer in, you know, especially with organizations that uh, each person's involved in. You know, if you're not willing to to work to make towards make changes, making those positive changes towards short of like everyone else being against you to that end, I don't know that that organization necessarily. And again, this isn't an indictment on the people that have left the court. It's, it's an indictment on the people that have been expelled from the court, but not the people that have left the court voluntarily. I'll say that I don't think that that is uh, the right way of going about life and going through life. I, you know, if you've got problem with something that so many of my friends and really dear close friends that have committed, including some of them myself, that you've dedicated so much time and energy and, and blood and sweat and literal tears to something and someone within the organization fucks something up. I don't think that it's an appropriate response to say, well, this is just endemic of, of everything that's that's wrong with all these other areas of life. And then it's spilling over into these organizations. Is the organization or is the CMS, uh, does it have flaws? Sure. You know, no one will not say that, but is every single one of the master sommeliers and, and advanced sommeliers and certified and, and intro, are they all trying to work to make it better? Are they all working to, to make themselves better? I certainly believe that. I can't give up on that. Uh, I can't give up on that ideal. I'm not going to concede uh, defeat to people that just say, oh, well, let's just, let's just fucking burn it all down because we had a bad experience. And that's not to say that yeah, I have dear friends that had their – during the whole uh, scandal, uh, cheating scandal, I have friends that had their, their results rescinded and they had passed. And I know for a fact that they passed honorably and my heart fucking broke for them. I can't even imagine that making the getting the results that you that you've passed and, and, and telling all your friends and family. I mean, fuck, man, like, I'm, I'm almost brought to tears right now. Like, I remember I remember crying so fucking hard when I passed my advance. I can't imagine how hard I'm going to cry when I pass my master exam. To that end, like it, it really sucks, you know, to, to see that. And and at the same time, there are a lot of people saying like, oh, they should only have expelled those people and uh, that that they actually caught cheating and they shouldn't have resented the results for the people that passed honorably. And I understand that. And and the the choice to to avoid the exams, if I'm those examiners, if I'm those master sommeliers, I don't know what other choice is available because there's no way that you can prove despite even in like your deepest like heart of hearts that you know that these people have passed honorably and you know that they didn't cheat you know that's not in their character you know that like i know them kind of thing despite that you still can't prove beyond you know that reasonable doubt that they didn't receive a text or that the the that someone in passing on in a hallway or something like that because the the nature of these exams and again the court is trying to improve itself yes you, you could say that, that that was an awakening moment uh, for the court to to better its practices and become, you know, arguably more academic, a little more transparent, or a lot more transparent, honestly, by way of how the exams are conducted, how the results are being given, X, Y, Z. There's a lot of sentiment. It's a very hard thing to look at at that whole chain of events, and even some of the continued like murmurings that you hear online and, and in person. A lot of people saying like, you know, well, let's just abandon this because it's they've lost their way, and therefore. You know, there, there's nothing salvageable. I don't believe in that. I'm again the the ideal of the ideal of people coming together within the court and, and bettering it, making it better. And and again, that fellowship, that that the whole reason of why we do this and why we've come so far. You know, I can't abandon that. So when to answer your question, or, or to better, hopefully better answer your question, going back to it, how how did I you know view that? Highly disappointed, but not deterred in a second that, that this is. The path that I want to continue, and not only that, not it, it, I believe so deeply in this. It's not a I want to just continue because I'm this far along, and I want to I want to get this accreditation for me. I'm doing this for me for those selfish reasons. I think the the selfless 
portion of this entire court of this entire organization, call it blind world at large, you know, I'm not where I am today. I, were it not for the people that came before me that have, you know, took the time out of their day and night to help teach me things, help show me like, hey, put this glass in front of me, you know, as simple as that and say, this is malolactic. Hey, this is, these are bananas. Like, hey, this is X, Y, Z. Or, hey, read this book. It's going to blow your mind. Or, hey, like, listen to this podcast. It's really cool. Or even just sitting there and as I do like my blind calls and just record what I say and write it down and say like, hey, you know, you said this, I think you meant that or whatever. I would be remiss in, in I think my ethics and my morals and just the, the person that I am, uh, were I not to give that back, were I not to continue that chain. And I think to give up on on the quarter to say like, hey, let's let's burn it all the fuck down. Let's let's do this would be to throw all of that away. I'm not the type of person to do that. Over the course of going through these exams, what has been the most difficult part of the process for you? Learning how I learn, honestly, that's which I feel like has only come into its own the past couple of years, surprisingly. Uh, you get uh, as, as you have like this, this hunger really to, to continue your education and, and to always just crave more information, finding new ways to kind of store that information and recall it, not just in terms of an examination, uh, scenario, but like on the floor, you know, it, restaurants are con controlled chaos. Sometimes yeah, I would argue that there's no control, but anybody that's worked in restaurants, especially in, in, in high pressure scenarios and whatnot can understand that, you know, there's a lot going on. It's like, I got salads going to that table. I've got to take an entree order over there. I've, I've got the drinks waiting for me at the bar over there. I've, I got to go back to the kitchen. I got to tell chef that there's an allergy on table 43, that kind of thing. And then at the same time, you're, you're maintaining, you know, as best you can, that kind of stoic demeanor at the table. And, I'm, and this is as it pertains to fine dining, but, and then, you know, being peppered with questions. It's like, well, I see it says like, uh, your wine list has broken the Rhone North and Rhone South. Like what's, why, why is that? Blah, 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 blah. And so you're maintaining all these things in your head of like, oh, you know, I've got all these other tables and all these other responsibilities, but I have to be able to recall those those reasons and feed them the information in a polite and, and professional and succinct way under that pressure, under that gun. So learning that that said, learning how I learn and learning how to like get that information in my head and, and kind of store it, so to speak, in a way that I can, you know, I got it right here and this is this is it. Certainly it takes practice, but that getting again it's an infinite amount of information and and trying to store that all in like a cohesive and, and succinct manner is, is a big challenge so i find mixing media for me is is the best um is the best way to do things maybe that's the add in me but you know some people say oh there's auditory learners there's visual learners blah 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 um i i feel like i'm a mix of both and it, it's it's very transient from day to day of what sticks best for me and my so that and uh, or gracefully getting my loved ones to understand what I'm doing in my life. Is there a particular region that's been especially challenging for you? You know, for some it's Germany because of basically it just being a completely different language and none of it really overlaps to English. For some it's Italy because it's all its own thing. They like every single grape, they call it something else kind of thing. So has there been one for you that was particularly harder than the others? Italy. I know that's not an uncommon answer, you know, for the multitude of reasons of 1,800 new DOCGs every other day and a million freaking grapes. And I think I even have it somewhere like on my Instagram or whatever. I made like a, a lazy meme. I was studying one day. I was so fucking frustrated. This is a few years back. I was like trying to cram some region in my head. And I'm like looking at these maps and I'm just like looking at how like I don't even know what the region was, but like the different areas kind of overlap and whatnot, and they go out into other zones and whatnot. It's like, okay, well, I got to realize that in this Southwest corner, it's IGT and DOC style, and then, but it, like 300 meters over there, it's DOCG, but not this. And, and then over here, you know, they can plant that. Yeah, you know, I was trying to do this and I'm like looking at these maps and I arguably was just like, had like brain burnout because sometimes I'll do that. I'll forget how long it's been and I've been trying to like cram something and I, I'm bad about taking breaks and, uh, and allowing myself to decompress or like allow the information to absorb. Sometimes I remember thinking back, like looking at this map and then I was like, you know, like this, like just looks like one of those fucking multicolored wire with the beads thing. And like a doctor's office that is your kid. Yeah. Yeah. It's a version of like the abacus. 
yeah, sort of, but it's like all mixed up in different colors and whatnot. And I was like, that's what this fucking map looks like. And I like, I had been tracing maps. I threw it across the room. I'm like, that's fucking stupid. And then like later on that day, I'm like, Oh, maybe somebody will relate to this. So I made like a picture like of that. It was like, Hey, this is fuck you, Italy. Like, <laughs> not really. I love Italy, but you know what I'm saying? At the time it was frustrating. So you mentioned you've taken the master twice. You're going to sit for it again. Is that something that you're dead set on? You know, cause the way it, I think it's structured, right. Is you pass one part and then you get to pass the next part and, and yada, yada. And you get like three cracks at it or whatever before you have to redo it. So with where you're at, is that something that, if for some reason you don't pass it this next time, will you do the cycle over again? Or you're like, you're dead set on. I'm not stopping. I'll pass that exam. So going back to your kind of experience in restaurants, because you were at Jeff Ruby's for a while, you're working there and eventually you become their corporate wine manager. What's the biggest challenge or biggest difference in being a corporate wine manager versus a traditional beverage director, wine director, beverage manager? Like what extra stuff are you doing versus those other roles that I think people understand more? That was actually, I eventually grew into the beverage director role. I went from wine manager, that was my intro to the the corporate offices. And we had at the a guy named Brian, he uh, was hired on as the uh, beverage director, a very seasoned guy. He went down the the MW path, again, like a different like school of thought, great guy. And I was hired on at the time. I was the AGM of Carlo and Johnny, our, our location, or the Jeff Ruby location uh, based out of uh, Montgomery. And I was, this is right before I passed the advanced sommelier exam. So I got hired on because the corporate office was restructuring. We were growing as, a, as an organization. I had made the case plain to the Ruby. I was, I was like, listen, you need somebody to, to run this for you. Like I, I'm, I did a really good job managing this one location. Uh, if you give me these other locations, I can run these wine programs very effectively and streamline everything like I have here at this restaurant and just apply my philosophies and structures to and training to all these other locations. And, and thankfully, they, they went for that. And I was hired on as a corporate wine manager. And my, my role between that and, and the, the corporate wine director, which came, I think, about like three months later, wasn't very different. Other than pay structure and title, but the the job was was itself the same. You know, it's it's focusing purely on the wine, getting the the wine programs at each location under one voice, uh, under one cohesive vision. And then I did that. In the I think I was in that role for close to two years, and then Brian actually got hired on at uh, uh, Nema Colon out in Pennsylvania, I think it's Pennsylvania uh, it resort, and he got hired away. And I remember we were just about to open our Lexington location. And it was this big thing. I remember I was down in Nashville uh, at the time because, you know, I was responsible for all of these locations. So I was on the road a lot, traveling from restaurant to restaurant, you know, making sure things are in line, making sure that we're getting the best deals, X, Y, Z, all those all those things you have to do uh, as you run a, a wine program. It's an hour behind there. So he called me, it was like Saturday morning. He called me at like 6 a.m. Nashville time. I was like, yeah, fuck, hello? I think I probably had even had a couple of drinks of that before, so I wasn't feeling great. And uh, he's like, Keegan, it's Brian. I just want to let you know that uh, I haven't told anybody else yet, but I you know, accepted an offer with, with this thing. I'm, I'm going to be you know, leaving in February or whatever. And we were slated to open up the Lexington location like a month later after he was going to leave. And I was like, okay. And I hung up and I was like, thanks for calling. You know, we, we talked for a little bit. I remember sitting there in bed and I was just like, okay, well, now's my shot. For the the whole thing kind of thing like i gotta i gotta make sure that i bust ass for this and i want to show i know that i'm ready for the uh, beverage director role which enta- entails a hell of a lot more than just just wine not to say to diminish the requirements of like a wine director or, or anyone that's purely but you know when you add spirits when you add iced tea when you add coffee when you add beer you know anything liquid effectively to the plate that universe expands rapidly and so i did i made sure that the Lexington location uh, opened, you know, smoothly. There was just like with any restaurant opening there, you know, you have no sleep, but this was like that on, on crack on steroids. I, because I knew what the implications were, where I'd pull it off. So about, I want to say three months after the successful launch of Lexington, I was promoted to, to beverage director for the company. Then the whole shebang was mine. You know, that was, and I was in that role for approximately five ish years, something like that. Uh, in that role as beverage director. And th- there was a, a large gradient of learning curve. But thankfully, I'm not afraid of, of one, doing the work, but then two, cramming my head with, with more shit that probably nobody cares about. But 
you got to be very organized. You have to, uh, you have to be prepared to take the calls at all hours, especially, you know, in a corporate role, you know, one of the things that was difficult from, from the onset, but even more so when I took on even more responsibilities, when you take on a, a director role, you take on a, uh, a restaurant corporate role, you have to be 24, seven, 365, particularly within the restaurants within Jeff Ruby's because you're working that quote unquote nine to five, which was never nine to five. It was usually like seven to seven. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, the restaurants don't open until the evening. So you got to be able to put out fires and, and take the phone calls from, from everybody in the restaurants. They're like, Hey, this guy came in and you know, he wants this bottle of wine, but for wh- whatever reason, it's not in the system. Like, can you, can you put this on? Can you activate it so I can ring it up? Or, uh, Hey, this guy, uh, you know, things on the fly that are just like uh, this guy, uh, says that he wants this bottle of wine, but he wants to pay $5 less for it, blah, 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 you know, and he's not going to buy anything if you don't do it. And you got to make those calls and, and all that stuff. It's like, yeah, you know, like it's fun. You know, it's again, a lot of work, you know, you got to just be available. And that's, that's, a, I, th- I think probably the biggest struggle that anybody would uh, want to go down that path would have to face insofar as like, unless you're not working in a restaurant that's only open during lunch or something like that, which, you know, I, I, I don't know what places that have a corporate structure that are only open for lunch you know, maybe like first watch or something, but even still, you know what I'm saying? You just have to be available. And that was, that was probably the biggest, biggest challenge and balancing the work life thing too. That's another thing I'm admittedly not great at is not only do I not give myself the, my, give my brain the, the space it needs to like decompress and absorb or like focus on something else for a little while so I can have that mental health. But I guess the challenge of giving of myself all the time uh, is a hard thing for me to do. And I'm not trying to, that's not a fucking humble brag or anything like that, but it's, it was, is very difficult for me to, when someone needs me, you know, particularly with the business, it, it, not hard. It's it, impossible for me to like not answer that phone call. How did you wind up starting Ignition Wines? Like where did the idea come from? What led you to kind of doing that? Was it like a void or gap in the marketplace? Was it you just wanting to do your own thing outside of restaurants post pandemic? Like how did it start? I had been thinking for a while and, and, and what my path, I'm an ambitious, ambitious person. You know, I'm always trying to find new goals for myself and always trying to, to improve. And then also, I'm not trying to say that the job was boring, but not stay bored. You know, I, uh, new challenges and, and new experiences are something that really blows my hair back. So for a while there, I was considering, I was like, okay, like I'm at the director level. Uh, pretty much everybody above me in the corporate structure's last name is Ruby. Uh, you know, what, what's what's my path look like? You know, like what's, uh, I can't speak more highly of them and the organization than I can. And I, because I was with them for 20 years, you know, it's I, I truly believe in that company and, uh, and the people behind it. And I've made so many awesome friends and had so many great experiences. And the family's been so generous to me over the years. And I remember thinking, I had a couple of meetings with some of the people and, and, and I had that kind of, that, that question was something that was like, okay, what's, what's next? You know, what's the, I had gotten pretty good at, at the job. You know, I, I, at least I hope other people would agree with that. I, I think I did, but anyways, and I wanted to know what was next. And I had that, those conversations with some of the people. And, and a lot of times the questions were met with like, ah, uh, you know, and there w- really wasn't an answer. And so I had to start thinking, I'm like, you know, is this going to be my only job for the rest of my life? Is this like where I am for the rest of my life? Is this the, if the answer is yes, you know, listen, that that's a great life. I wouldn't knock anyone for taking that choice. I just wanted more. And, and that kind of like kind of grain of sand in my mind just kept like, you know, persisting. And I remember one day uh, earlier this year, I was in the shower and I was just like, I was thinking back on there, there was a gentleman named Mark Mayer who's not with us anymore. And he started cutting edge uh, distributors. I don't know if you're familiar with them or with, with him. He was an excellent person. He was formative for for me and influential on me and so many others in the Cincinnati area, I'm sure beyond those markets. But and he was so uplifting of the service industry in in the Cincinnati area, the greater Cincinnati area, I'm sure beyond. I keep his his picture up on my fridge. There's a picture of him holding uh, my favorite wine, Muga Prado Nea, big box of it. I remember thinking about him like I was in the shower and I was just like, it struck me, why can't I be that for the city. Why can't I be the new Mark Mayer? And those are big shoes that I'm sure I'll never fill. But, you know, in the spirit of that pursuit, I started thinking, I was like, why, why can't I do that? Why shouldn't I do that? What are the reasons that would stop me from, from being the person that, that the, the wine community, the service community, you know, sees as someone that is uplifting, that is uh, willing to guide others and to introduce wine to people uh, in a fun, 
and no bullshit kind of way. Cause we all know like not only the reputation, I'm sure we all know that the type of sommelier or wine professional and, uh, and, uh, and for these people, I'm going to put professional in quotation marks that, that have a snobbish attitude about the entire experience. And I think it's fucking bullshit. And I th- I think those people don't belong anywhere near anyone else in, in, in the capacity of describing, but that's a personal side. I, I remember thinking about that. And I'm like, I, why can't I be that person? Why can't I be that for other people? Why can't I, I do this? And, and so I, I just, it just snowballed. I was like, okay, like I've never been on the wholesale side. I've only ever been on, on the on-premise side, like you know, facing guests and, and facing, you know, other employees, other restaurant workers and, and bar and restaurant workers. And this is a whole new universe that I have no exposure to, but I would love to learn about. And I also think I'd be damn good at it. And so I started thinking, I was like, okay, like what's for a while there? I'm like, okay, like what's it going to be called? Like what, like, you know, once I kind of formed this idea, I was like, okay, it really started to snowball. I was like, okay, like I want to do this, but what's my ethos? So what's the, am I going to be just another distributor? Like, let's say that I am that guy. Everybody's like, oh, that guy's cool. Like whatever. Like, oh, he's really not a, a good wine mind, blah, 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 blah. Like what sets me apart from anyone else that's also got great employees at, at the other distributors? So the thought was there's first off the reality that there's a, a sea of wine. There's an ocean of wine uh, that goes unrepresented, particularly in the in the Ohio markets, because we're considered, I think, unfairly a uh, flyover state. But uh, you know, there's so much good juice out there. There's so many stories to tell. There's so many regions that that aren't even represented, and even the regions that are represented. There's plenty of winemakers that are doing something cool, that are doing something unique, that are they're bringing to the table something different, and and they're overlooked by some of these bigger players in the markets that then they don't get the love that they deserve knowing that and and thinking to myself like okay well bringing them into the market and growing those brands and and connecting the winemakers and wineries that are hungry for this audience and hungry for like this region or even just anyone to to get their wines in front of i started thinking i was like okay you know still need a name still need like and so i started thinking about okay like again i'm a fucking nerd you know, my background is aerospace engineering. I've always loved, I, when I was a kid, and this is why I went to Purdue for aerospace was because I wanted to uh, be an astronaut and Purdue graduated more astronauts than any other university. I felt that was my, was my pathway. It was there or uh, the Air Force Academy, but famously or infamously, uh, the week before I signed my, uh, was going to sign my letter of intent for the Air Force Academy, 9-11 happened. And my dad uh, was in the army in Vietnam and uh, he sat me down and that night and he's like, you need to pick another school. You're not going to war. I respect my father very much. And, and I made the decision anyway. So I, I went with Purdue and, and so I, going back to <laughs> the name, I was like, okay, I love space. I love like nerdy shit like that. Like what's the tie between space and wine? Like what's the, how can I make that work? Is there a connection? And and then I'm thinking, it's like, no, as I, I'm literally bringing brands in and I'm launching them into these areas and I'm growing them. And I was like, fucking ignition. Like, why don't, why don't I call it ignition? Like literally it's, and that's the whole ethos. So I got together uh, uh, with a bunch of my friends, some of my close friends, uh, Mike Dew and Tom Bolton. They're both just badass graphic designers and, and they have just a world of experience. You know, we were, we've, we had multiple meetings and we were talking and about just the, the look and feel. And, and I was thinking back towards like, yeah, I started thinking about like the Apollo missions and, and, you know, Saturn V rockets and just the spirit of like the sixties and, and the moonshot, you know, like that's what I wanted to encapsulate. So that kind of atomic age, if you look at the styling and the, the branding of, uh, of everything, the, the origin of all of that was because, you know, I wanted to capture this exploratory nature of everything and, and, and being able to, communicate to people that wine is still something like even the moon, you know, like we, we can be, we look at the moon all the time. People look at the moon and it's like, Oh yeah, it's a fucking moon, whatever. But there's still shit to be, even though we've been there, there's still shit to be explored. There's still things to be found, you know, and, and discovered and in new ways of thinking about it. I want to apply that, that spirit to Cabernet and Sonoma. You know, you've had Cabernet and Sonoma or Cabernet and Napa Valley a thousand times. Awesome. Well, this one producer does it this way. And it's a new expression of Cabernet that you've never discovered before. It's something new. You know, it's, it's, there's still things to be discovered. And it's one of the, the, the many things that I love about wine too. I can always discover new things. And, and that exploratory nature was, was the nascence of, of ignition. So how do you decide what wines you want to work with? What wines you want to bring into the market? Does it have to go through kind of a process that you have? Like, obviously it has to taste good, but are you looking for something in particular regions? Are you trying to build out kind of a, 
a list, quote unquote, that you have available that is pretty well rounded? Like, what's the process? Because my understanding is for distributors, like for a winery, you kind of get one per state kind of thing. So like, like you, if you have a specific wine, like you'll have it for Ohio, but you might be competing against somebody else in New York who's trying to get the allocation from that place. So, so how do you kind of approach all that and figure out what you're passionate about being able to talk about and bring into the Cincinnati area? Well, first and foremost, I'm not going to represent a product I don't believe in or the people either. I'm pretty old school in, in my, I guess, demeanor sometimes when it comes to at least business is I'm, I'm very much a handshake person. You know, I, I like to meet with people and, 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 and look at them in the eyes and say like, Hey, you know, like this, these are my expectations. What are your expectations? You know, how do you want your brand represented? Does it fit? And if it's not a good fit, then, then that's all well and good. That's fine. But there's going to be a hundred other wineries that are a good fit. And on top of that, you know, I'll full transparency with everyone is, you know, if we're not going to be a good fit, or if I feel like, you know, a particular winery or winemaker will be better served with someone else. I, I have, I have no qualms about helping facilitate that relationship, not only because I believe in playing nice in the sandbox, but my entire goal outside of uh, the distributor uh, angle or, or, or my professional angle, my, my goal in life really is to get wine in people's glasses and, and to get wine in front of people and to get people drinking wine. Obviously, the hope is it's my wines, right? <laughs> but, you know, when, when I'm when I'm looking for particular uh, wineries and, re- and regions and whatnot, I Sure. First and foremost, I want to, I go for things that blow my hair back and things that I'm excited about because I, I don't think that it, it behooves anyone to, for me to like go in and necessarily waste somebody's time to put something in front of them that I don't believe in. Cause that one, it's a horrible sales tactic because anybody can sniff that shit out a mile away. It's like, you know, you go to something like, ah, oh, you know, here you go. This is our cab. And this is uh here you go. It's, that's their sub blunt. What, what do you think? You know, like, you can hear just in the tone, like, I don't give a fuck about that wine or those wines. Like, I, what's the point? Uh, and I'm doing this whole thing too, by the way, it's because I want to do things. I want to do more of the things that I love. And I, and that's primarily talking about wine, but why would I waste my time? It's, we only get so much time on this planet and I want to, I want to spend it obsessing about the things and, and the people that I love. And to that end, finding those wineries and winemakers that align with that ethos is is first and foremost my my priority. How often are you pitched wines or someone like sends you a sample unsolicited? Like, hey, would you like to carry our product? Like, does that happen pretty frequently? There's like their whole like uh, website services that that kick back people's contact informations and, and and stuff like that that distribute your your contact information from 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 winery to winery. Uh, in the hopes of like getting them exposure, which honestly it's it's a good and bad thing because you get inundated with sometimes shit that's not even wine related. That's like it, like hey, we we've, we've got this chocolate popsicle uh, fusion uh, that's served you know in a gaseous orb that you know is delivered by this or whatever. And you're like, what the fuck are you guys talking? Like, what is this product even? Like, I don't even know what this is. Like, you're getting punked. Like, I. Uh, Thank you for the consideration. I appreciate the email. You know, you got to be polite. Certainly, it's it's kind of funny. You get a lot of people that that, that reach out to you. But I, the other part of it too is, is is balancing you know my palate with what I know that other people would love to. I might get a sample of something that I'm like, this doesn't particularly speak to me. You know, this might not be something that I first reach for. X Y day. You know, if it's a hot summer day or something like that, am I going to reach for this particular wine or this particular white wine or whatever? It's a if it's Thanksgiving, am I reaching for this particular red wine or something like that? Maybe not, but do I respect like the styling and, and everything? Is this something that I know that a lot of my friends or, or a lot of people in the market would, would really enjoy? Well, then I'm like, okay, I can, I, can see, I can see the application here. Again, though, it has to fulfill that requisite of got to love the people and the winemakers. Two, it has to also be a quality product. You don't have to necessarily gravitate to every single wine that a winemaker likes. And purely because you know it's not something that blows your hair back, like stylistically, purely because of that, because uh, we all have our predilections, we all have our you know predispositions of like whatever. But if it's something that like somebody like really respects and would really enjoy, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that I get that in their glass. I, that's a, I don't think I <laughs> worded that very well, but if that makes sense, like first and foremost, gotta satisfy priority one of do I respect the product? Do I do I love the winemakers? I'm a believer that that there's quality here, and then protocol two is is this something also that I can see other people liking, even if it's not something that is my number one thing to grab for. 
Is there a style of wine or a varietal that is requested more or moves most out of your portfolio than others? Cabernet for sure is king. You know, that that's that's something that California cab, Washingtonian cab, you, you can't knock at success, you know. It's king for a reason, especially in, in our markets, but there's some 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 beautiful productions that cab and chardonnay is there a, a specific wine or a wine region that you'd like to be able to carry more of or tap into but it's just pretty difficult to get right now whether it's canadian wine or wine from michigan or something like that where it's just like if i could somehow get my hands on some of this like i think it'd be really not just cool to be able to do that and hopefully it fits all the parameters of what you're looking for but you also think people would be really open to to seeing that out of your customer base spain has always been you know one of my original loves if i had started this years and years or maybe decades ago i could have gotten my hands on iconic producers but who knows what's going to happen like down the line you know so my favorites might might fall into my hands if i'm lucky i work hard but that said as far as like uh, you know a region that's like really cool that i selfishly want to see succeed uh down in baja in mexico via guadalupe my wife and i went there i had so I used to live in San Diego uh, for a brief period in 2015, and I would travel down there. It's only two hours away from San Diego. You just hop right down the border, and it is just a beautiful, beautiful wine region. And so I, I, I always wanted to take my wife there, and, and we went. This was in 2020, actually. So this was the summer of 2020. Most things are locked down, uh, unfortunately, in the United States. Mexico uh, had you know their shit together and they had their economy still rolling and had their protocols in place and let's take a trip let's fly out to san diego and rent a car we can drive up and down the coast and we did that for a while doing the um we did the whole like visit the winery wearing masks thing and that was just fucking awful just like i'm sure everybody else remembers but and then i was like you know let's go down to baja let's spend a, let's spend like some days you know, some time down in baja because I, I i think it's awesome and so we went down there and, and we spent i think four days Three, three nights, four days down in, in Vida Guadalupe. And it's it's peninsular. So like the, the climate down there is just, it's awesome. It is just so perfect. I mean, like 70 degrees, sunny, nice and dry. And they're growing some kick-ass bridal. I mean, like, talk, like awesome Cabernet, yes, but like they're growing Sangiovese. They're growing Tempranillo. They're growing Merlot. You know, there's a lot of Bordelais varietals. And, and some whites too. They're doing Sau Blanc. They're doing Chardonnay. And and the wineries are world class. It's Mexico, so everything's super cheap. I mean, we, I think the two of us, like, we ate and drank like kings and queens for you know those those four days with lodging and all the wine tastings and all that stuff, and, and just being pissed drunk the entire time because we're on vacation. I think I spent like four hundred dollars between the two of us. Shit, I'll take that all day long. I, I also like to joke to people, like, not only because uh, you know Spanish wines are my favorite, but Latin culture is is uh, is, is one of my one of my loves like I, I feel like i've got you know latin blood in me somehow despite my irish heritage you know i think some some along the lines i you know someone spliced something with somebody to give me we've had a few people on and they've kind of touched on it but is ohio wine law pretty stable year in year out or is it always changing really tough to kind of navigate this this being year one for me with this company it's it's hard for me to to put a gauge on that I will say, though, that it seems like, for better or worse, there's a lot of tribal knowledge with regards to navigating those the laws and the codes that, by way of like the regulators or by way of attorneys or, or you know, XYZ, you know, the control board, all that stuff. It, it seems to be like a lot of found information, like to where you're, you're, and maybe this is such with like any other industries, but I doubt it considering, you know, the, the impact that prohibition had on, on everybody, but it, it, it just seems to me that like the there's no like exact flowchart for handle how to handle certain things or or what you truly need to do to satisfy all the all the requirements for whatnot whether it's like warehousing or your vehicle requirements or the type of insurance that you need or the uh, the bonding amount for the supply that you have or your particular warehouse and 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 who you need to contact for all that information like you can't just google this shit like i felt like such a, a dumbass sometimes like just like ohio law enter like <laughs> okay well that yields like 500 things and, and it's usually like some like random article from the columbus herald from like 2007 it's like okay well that that search yielded jack shit like okay you, so you have to like talk to a lot of attorneys and you got to like get interpretations on things and so but that said, to answer your question, like variation from year into year out, 
I, I can't give you a, a, an honest answer because I haven't been doing this for, for that long. On the on-premise side, I don't think so. You know, the, the biggest fluctuation I think, you know, we might see is like, uh, particularly with with uh, with COVID, obviously, you know, all that navigation of, of the bullshit with social distancing. And that was a whole other thing. And thankfully that's passed. But, you know, navigating that mess, navigating, um, you know, like shipping laws, for example, like like who who can send you samples and whether or not a winery from a particular state can send samples into into Kentucky or Tennessee or Ohio. And, uh, that's speaking, of course, from the restaurant side of things, and, and particularly from for the Jeff Ruby side of things, because I was managing you know those seven locations across those three states. So <laughs> I guess the further answer to the question too is sometimes it's difficult for me to like get straight in my head whose state's laws are what. You know, I'm not saying that I've ever broken the law or anything, but it's you always have to take pause and take a moment. It's like is this fucking is this Kentucky thing or no 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 that's that's Tennessee is that Tennessee no no that's Ohio you know that kind of thing. So. You uh, did a podcast for a little while with Eric Faber, Grapes and Stuff. Thoughts on bringing that back or just not enough time? No, yeah, I th- we really want to. And, and if you're open to it, we'd love to like coll- collab or something. Um, that was a, a fun thing that we did. Uh, uh, shout out to uh, uh, Mr. Joe Strecker, who is our, our producer. He produces a lot of morning shows for 700 WLW and uh, the radio station here in Cincinnati. I think you can get it up in Columbus, if I'm not mistaken. It's a pretty far reach. But yeah, we, we like Eric and I, Actually, most recently, I was like having cigars at his place like a month ago or something. And we were just talking about it. And you know how it goes. Like, we need to start, you have a couple of drinks and you come up with all these grand ideas. And then, by, you know, next you know, it's like an hour later and we're like, we got this whole business plan for expanding this and blah, blah, blah. And then you wake up in the morning and you're like, I don't think a three hour segment on grilled cheese would, uh, would really fly. But, uh, you know, it was nice that we were able to entertain ourselves for a while. And, and by the way, if, if you've ever done a three hour segment on grilled cheese, I'm not, I'm not trying to knock it out, you know, but you know what I'm saying? Like picking something obscure and, but yeah, we've talked about it and, and, you know, it was a fun thing to do for a little bit and I'd like to get back into it, but you know, I, I want this to that difficulty of prioritizing things that comes with ADD and all that shit. And man, I'm blaming a lot of my, a lot of my foibles on, on that bullshit, but I don't know, maybe just have to let your listeners stay tuned. When you uh, go out to dinner, are you able to just kind of check out, enjoy the experience, or do you compulsively check the wine list? Oh, God. It's a fucking struggle. It really is. And not just so much of, certainly, I mean, you always, like, any psalm, like, checks out the wine list and, and whatnot, and you, you, uh, after you do it a while, you, you, you one, for the, for the people that, that do, you know, check out wine lists and, and whatnot, it's, I get it. You got to keep your, your ego in check a lot of times, because you don't want to let things like, like like your critiques like run away with themselves because your list isn't perfect either so like don't even open that door and i'm also like paranoid that that's what other people are thinking again you know like when i'm in the restaurant and again i'm not saying that like this isn't my ego talking about like when i walk into a restaurant no like i've got friends that are in the industry right like like no matter who it is like if, if it's another psalm or whatever it's a buddy of yours you're like your your anxiety goes like really through the roof because you're like oh they're seeing this and they're seeing that and they're seeing that and blah 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 blah. and i can't let them see this because i forgot to change the bin number on this today and fuck of course they would walk in of all nights you know you got to like keep that in in the back of your head and so yeah you know i I gotta have to keep that in in check i I hate that anxiety and i don't want other people to, to feel that at the same time too it's working in restaurants and being like having my teeth cut in in the restaurant scene for so long it's uh it's hard. It's harder for me to just turn off the restaurant mind than it is like to like ignore like you know if somebody misspells something on a fucking wine list like I don't give a shit like what I, I get it like oh there's no accent here on the A and there should be like oh this should have been a circumflex over the over the O and Rhone like you forgot that like one again going back to the snobbery shit like fuck those people are they trying to get wine in your glass are they trying to provide you with like you know with warm hospitality, then shut the fuck up. Like what, what are you critiquing spelling for? But it's more like, like, and this is probably a reason why, like I, I love sitting at the bar almost exclusively is because I ha- I can keep my back to the dining room because when I'm sit- seated in dining rooms, I, I can't turn the shit off. I have to, that table over there needs water. That table should have been cleared five minutes ago. Clearly that food runner has no idea where those dishes are going. Should have served from the left there. You know, that kind of shit. Like, it's not like uh, me being a dick thing. It's just like, you know, you, you, you're you training just the, the nature of the beast, you know, like you do it for so long and at such a high level. That's the hard thing for me to drop. So I usually like I go to the bar, try to get my booze in me fast enough to where I don't 
like before my brain starts working, I try to numb it so that I don't notice those things. Everybody has a wine or a wine region that they gravitate towards. Like it was the thing they're awakening or, or whatever. It was that one wine or wine region that they just, they love, will always love whatever it is. So every Psalm has it. What's yours? What's the one that like really got you into wine? And that's, that's the one that uh, you're always going to kind of gravitate towards. Tempranillo uh, from Rioja. I remember like tasting like the, the 2001 Muga Prado Nea, and that that was a formative wine for me. That's honestly one of my coveted wines that you know I search for all the time. Um, I have a, a stock of in my personal cellar at home, and that's that is a, a very special wine specifically. But more at large, the region, just the way that Tempranillo hits my palate, and that I gravitate towards it, its body, its weight. Its characteristics, uh, the nuance, the flavor, the bouquet, everything about it, and then coupled with the times that I've been there, you know, visiting it, making it real, tasting the food, meeting the people. Um, I love Spain. Spain is at large my favorite country on the planet. Arguably, it's hard for me to pin that down as, or being say like this is my number one with a bullet. But I just truly love Spanish wines and Spanish cuisine, and just you know, honestly, their lifestyle. But yeah, Tempranillo, Tempranillo from Rioja. That's that's always the one that. No matter, I don't care what time of day it is. I don't care what the what the weather is like. I don't care what's going on. I can always enjoy that. Are there any underrated or lesser known wine regions or grape varietals that you believe deserve more recognition, more attention from the wine drinking public? Oh, good question. Um, I believe that to be one of them. I think that uh, Washington. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a big advocate for Washingtonian wine. So, you know, I have some in the in our portfolio, and I believe so much in that region. And that's probably like my number two, honestly. When we like the state of Washington at large, and and certainly like there's a there, there's a lot of variation to that because they it, it's such an incredibly interesting place in the world for wine, and it's burgeoning right now. I mean, it, not only is it beautiful, not only is it really cool, but the the wine scene there is is impeccable they've done an excellent job the washington state wine uh commission is is done an incredible job organizing themselves uh promoting themselves and trying to get their wines and the glasses of people outside the region as best they can and i had always loved that wine region or that you know general place for a long time not only because the, the wines spoke to me but also especially let's face it wine's not cheap especially if you want to get into this as like a a career or even as a hobby it's it's there's expense that's incurred and there's so much value to be had there i, I guess selfishly i i hope that it doesn't explode but as an advocate i have to make sure that or help to the best that i can that it that it does explode and, and becomes more popular but status as far as Oregon versus Oregon or California, not as many people gravitate towards Washingtonian wines and again i selfishly am not to oppose that because I like to keep the cost down because that's what I love to drink and you know that kind of thing. At the same time, it, there's so much to be learned. I've been there several times now. I've got a lot of friends out in the Washington uh, wine area at large. It's just I think a, a very special place to visit. I think there's something for everyone. Go look up like the Missoula floods, which has impacted. I don't know if you're familiar with those at all, but like this is like the geology side of my nerddom. So effectively. You know, why Why do we love, it's approximately the same latitude as Bordeaux. So they're able to grow all these high quality grapes. It's effectively high desert. The difference between nighttime and daytime temperature, that, that is one of the most extreme in the world. So you have bright, fresh acidity and you have, you know, fully ripe fruit flavors because they can get all the sun. Uh, you have the higher ele elevation. You have the myriad of soils that are able to sustain so many different varietals of wine. So the Missoula floods are this like really crazy to like to that effect. That was this really crazy, I think, freakishly awesome geologic event, environmental event that occurred in the last ice age where there's this massive ice, ice dam that sat above the state of Washington uh, up into California. And it broke and it created this flood of water that was something to the tune of 800 feet high, rushing at about 70 miles per hour that sustained for uh, approximately a week that washed over the entire state. Like when you think of that, like, it's like, holy fuck, like all the, think of all the boulders and all the sediment and all the trees and all the, all the animals and everything that just got, you want to talk like apocalyptic. That's what, but then when you like read further into it, like that happened like 70 times, like it's insane. 
And you can, there's places in, in these wineries where they've dug out whole sections of like the hillside and you can see these like layers where like each one was a flood. And then it adds up to this like cliffside that's a hundred feet high. And you're like, holy fuck, like this was serious, you know? But because of that, one of the, and on top of that, like they had volcanoes, like ancient volcanoes and all this volcanic bedrock and all this stuff, like so many things to learn there. There's a great analogy school in Washington state that's producing a lot of really kick-ass young winemakers. And there's just a lot of excitement. I, I love that. I wish more people would drink Washingtonian wine. What's next for you professionally? What do you have upcoming? Really just focusing on this company and getting it off the ground and, and getting it, you know, further solidified in the community. And as you mentioned, the, the Grapes and Stuff podcast, it is something that Eric uh, Faber and I would love to like kickstart and, again and, and do probably more on like a lump and fun that we can rant about different bullshit grapes and you know, random, random shit. I don't know if you ever listened to it, but we're not exactly pontificating about the, the world's woes. We're just, there's usually, it's like brief form. We just go in with, with no plan and until like two minutes before. And then like, you know, the record buttons hit and we're like, uh, so anyways, I was, you know, beyond that, it's getting kind of re-injected into the wine community around uh, this region in a different capacity. That's one thing that I want to, I've helped train a lot of uh, sommeliers and have trained uh, a lot of the wine professionals, at, at least directly within the Jeff Ruby restaurant. But being in that training environment, you know, I want to see it from the wholesale side, kind of further my exposure, more restaurant and bar professionals. Uh, I've got the national goal working towards that spirit of Mark Mayer was and what Mark Mayer did when he was alive. I think that is something that I want to continue to work towards. I don't have any specific, uh, I guess, um, to some degree, I'm not the type of guy that's like, well, in Q3, I want to uh, have, you know, three point blah, blah, blah. I've certainly goals fall, follow more into the spirit of, of what my personal goals are. That. This next question comes from a previous guest on the podcast, sommelier and owner of Flight Cleveland, uh, Lindsay Smith. She left behind for you. If money was no object, what would you do? Money was no object. I'd buy a bunch of parcels of land and probably grow some grapes on each of them with a, a small little house or something and spend my days flying around with my wife, my kids, and, and our dogs making wine here and there. It's kind of my uh, ultimate retirement goal, assuming that I'll ever retire, which I don't think will happen. But I just, I just want to be able to kick back and make some wine. You know, it's, uh, I think that's going to be the next adventure for me. So that might answer or help answer too, like the really long term professional goals from the previous question. But that's, you know, not going to be for a, a very, very long time. Yeah, money, money's no object. That's, that's that's what I do. Kick back with my dogs and, and grow some grapes. What question do you want to leave behind for the next guest? What legacy do you hope to leave behind? Next question comes from one of our listeners. They wrote in, what is one wine not currently in your portfolio that you wish was? So That's a hard one that you could go the route of like, well, I know this wine would like is awesome and you know, would make a ton of money and like, there'd be a lot of acclaim that kind of, I mean, you could say that about like DRC or something like that, Domingo and Romain Conti, but probably Muga, selfishly. I have uh, a great love for that. I've already mentioned it a couple of times and, and I know that's in the cutting edge portfolio and it's one of the formative wines. I, I highly doubt that, that Eric and, and Steve Mayer over there would, would ever relinquish it, but maybe one day I'll be able to convince them, but it'll probably take a lot of Beg and pleading and probably a whole fuck ton of money, but that's something because I, I love those wines. I, I love the winemaker, I winemakers. I love the, the property. Again, that's in uh, Rioja in Spain. It's one of my original loves. I, I just have a, a fond, fond place in my heart for, for that. And it's one of the things that I lo- enjoy drinking just in, in my, my downtime. But it's, it's, it's really funny, a, a funny story of when I was there. This was been there a couple of times for the first time I ever visited. Actually, Mark Mayer had, this was years ago. This is. 10 plus years ago, Mark Mayer had arranged this, this visit to the winery for me because I was traveling through, through France and Spain. And I get there and meeting up with the, the winemaker. At the time, I didn't speak that much Spanish. Now my Spanish has gotten a lot better, but I didn't speak too much at the time. And I knew like this kind of rudimentary shit. The winemaker said, like, oh, where are you from? And I was like, uh, United States. Yeah, no fucking shit. Like I, I could see her from the United States. Like, yeah, what? He's like, where in the United States? And I, and I was like, oh, uh, Ohio. And he's like, Ohio. And then in Spanish, he's like, he's losing his mind. He's like, he's like elated. He's like, ah, I, I love your trees. I love your trees. Oh, beautiful trees. And I'm like, I guess like fucking, yeah, we got trees. I don't, this is a, uh, <laughs> like, what? and they come to find out that he meant oak because they source exclusively Ohio and Kentucky American oak. And so I was like, I didn't even, like, I'm from there. I didn't fucking know that. I, I didn't know. That's kind of cool. Like, 
of all the places. So, so there's that like that kind of even even deeper connection for me in that winery and, and, and like where I'm from. I'm originally born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I'm like, cool. Like, how fitting is that? That like the wines that I love from this wine region and this winemaker, like they love they love my trees. What can I say? Like. <laughs> So this last set of questions we asked everyone who comes on the podcast. So nice compare and contrast for the listeners across all the episodes. First question, who would you say is the biggest influence on your career thus far when you look back on it? Probably say my dad. Again, like never, uh, never a wine guy, never, uh, and certainly like you could, you could say my parents, honestly, I, you know, my, my dad most recently when I was studying for the master song exam, he very generously donated about three days and nights straight of his time, just burning flashcards with me uh, right before the exam. But he and my mom dedicated so much time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears, I mean, like in, into educating both myself and my sister and, and making sure that we had that thirst for knowledge and just a, a unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Because without that, one, I don't think I would be able to continue to, to motivate myself nearly as well if I didn't always stay curious and I didn't always want to keep cramming shit. And, and this goes for not only wine, but for fucking everything else. A lot of which, you know, I, you could argue shit I'll never need or know or need to know or, or bring up in conversation. It's something that, that really motivates me. So I, I want to say, I want to say my parents, my, my dad specifically, but my, my parents at large are, are just such wonderful people. And, and without them, I, I, I don't know that I would have had the, the mental forthrightness or fortitude to, to pursue something as fucking batshit crazy as going after the master some exam. <laughs> what is your desert island wine? I want to say that 2001 Prado Anea, but at the same time, it's like desert island. Is it hot? Like, what's the. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's going to be kind of hot, kind of humid, right? You know, but you're still on the ocean because you're on an island. <laughs> I'm going to go with like, uh, let's see. I don't want to get too nerdy. I can go with something really obscure, something I can drink all the time. I'm going to go with uh, Loire Valley Sauvignon Blanc. You're not actively in restaurants right now, but uh, when you were, what's a place that you'd recommend? You know, that wasn't a place that you were working at. Scenario you usually give a person gets stuck at the airport, stuck overnight. They reach out to you. Hey, you know, where should we go eat? You kind of point them in this direction. Usually depends on the, the, the type of uh, type of uh, like vibe they're looking for. You know, if they're looking for fine dining, you know, non, non Jeff Ruby's places, which, you know, that would, would have been my, my first go to, but who does a great job. If you're looking for kind of like the more like mid casual, not casual, but, um, because I don't want to insult them because I know they do a fine job. If you're, if you're looking for a you know, good elevated, uh, Italian style, but near and dear in my heart, there's a, a chef that just recently passed away, uh, chef Jean Roberto Cavell. Um, he had multiple restaurants, uh, but the one of his that I used to frequent all the time was, was one called table. It's no longer here. But uh, the remaining restaurant is called La Barra Buff here in Cincinnati. And it is, as far as fine dining goes, it's, just, it's classic French. It's, it's so good. Mary Lou is the maitre d' and she's the best in, in, in the city. On arguably the best I've ever seen. She's just, she's just a, an incredible person and, and she does her job so well. She just, she embodies that role so well. Uh, as far as like more like casual, you know, uh, they're more like me and they're like, hey, I'm looking for something to eat and send me to a, a fucking dive bar or send me to wherever, which is usually more my speed, honestly. It's not a dive, but it, it's uh, more casual and it's really cool. It's a place called uh, Highmark here in Cincinnati. It's actually not too far from the, uh, the, the Jeffrey Beast Precinct location. Yeah, that's, that's usually their burgers are awesome. Do the crinkle cut fries, which as anybody uh, worth their salt knows, crinkle cut is the number two cut behind seasoned curlies. So I just want to put that out there on the record. Uh, season curlies are the best. And if you disagree, well, just know that you're wrong. Bucket list travel destination, bucket list restaurant, place you have not visited yet, you still want to travel to. And also a restaurant you have not dined at yet, but you still want to eat at. I haven't touched much into the uh, to, to Asia. I want to say, like, uh, I haven't been to Japan. I haven't. India, I think, would be a, a wonderful place that I, I, would, I would love to go to. I, uh, it, it's hard for me to been to Africa, I spent, spent, been to Africa a few times. I spent a few months, a few trips of, of a couple months plus each going through Africa, South America and Central America. And, and but Africa is very near and dear to my heart, particularly Tanzania and Rwanda, uh, South Africa. I only mention that because there's an old saying that goes, you know, if, if you can only go to two continents in your entire lifetime, go to Africa twice. And I believe in that because it's just, there's just, it's so vast and it's so, 
incredible. But I digress. Mm-hmm. Haven't been to uh, haven't been to Japan. I, I would love to go there. I would love to go to India and spend time there. That, that's kind of like really exotic locations, or you know, kind of far flung. Not far flung, as I know J- Japan is not like it's exotic, but you know, it's not like that. You're not off the grid, so to speak. But off grid is usually my speed. That's why. I, right. um, as far as like restaurants that I want to go to, oh man, God, there's so many. A buddy of mine, he actually just a buddy of mine, Doug Brixen, who's uh, was awarded his first Michelin star last year, right before I got, got married. At them. Amazing, badass chef. He had opened a place called Betard in uh, in New York City. And I never got to go there while he was there. And now he's like on to a, a new venture. I always wanted to go there. I've been to the Le Cirque in, in New York, which was incredible. I haven't gone to the one in Vegas. Say restaurants or, or, or whatnot, like Jean Georges or whatever. A lot of these like, these, these places and whatnot that are they're pretty famous. But yeah, I don't know. I, I'd probably say like Batard or anywhere my buddy Doug is cooking. Honestly, that's that's the place I want to be. No, no, no why. I think he's one of the more talented people I've... Uh, uh, I've ever worked with, so uh, that's that's what I'm saying. Otherwise, I'm going to a fucking dive bar. I'm getting a shitty beer, and I want some greasy food. Craziest thing you've seen happen in a restaurant while you're working? We don't have enough time. One of the craziest things, like, and this probably is the the number one with the bullet, but I was the assistant general manager of the Jeff Ruby's Waterfront Restaurant, and it was this modified fuel barge, like way back in the day, that had multi story restaurant on top of it, fine dining. Uh, huge. And it was like more than a, literally more than a football field long, giant space. And it had three big giant moorings and, and gangways that secured it to the shore. It was a floating restaurant on the Kentucky side of the Ohio River overlooking Cincinnati. Beautiful view, cool spot, had this funky Miami Vice art deco, like everything pink and teal kind of look to it. Honestly, it's like it was it's the type of vibe that would really kill today, like crazily, but it was like straight 80s and like hadn't been renovated for forever. Anyways, we had always joked about like what like in pre-shift meetings and whatnot, we'd be like, you know, when this thing breaks free, what are we going to what are we going to do? Like, what's the like, what are we drinking on our way down to New Orleans? That kind of thing. We're going to float this fucker all the way down that that kind of thing. And you joke about it so many times. And and in the wintertime, you know, the Ohio River floods and it gets pretty fucking high and these these ramps that like during the summertime when the river's low, you know, you walk down to the restaurant and then when the river's up, obviously you walk up. I mean, the water's moving, right? So it was Good Friday, I think it was. It was March, yeah, March 12th of, I think, 2011. The day that will live in infamy. (laughs) Well, like, I literally, it was a Friday. Most of the business had come and gone. It was about 10 p.m. on a Friday and in walks Chris Collinsworth, who he and his wife frequent in the place all the time, really great people. They walk in with like 10 people and it's towards the end of the evening and it was a busy Friday night. But again, most of the patrons have come and gone. I was like, Chris, great to see you, you know, like get you a table. They didn't have a reservation. Like give me three minutes. Let me put a table together for you. You know, we get the table arranged and whatnot, show them to the table, uh, talking to them, like pick out some wine. I go grab the bottles. I'm sitting there and I'm opening the wine, pouring for its guests. I'm just bullshitting and catching up. I felt this like shudder, like the ground kind of like, you know, kind of felt like something hit the boat, which a lot of times, like literally whole trees will be floating down the river. So you don't know like what, whatever, you know, could, something could have struck the hole or something. So whatever, kind of used to it, but I was still kind of like, it was a pretty sizable shutter. And then one of the servers comes out of the side stand and he's like walking there and he's kind of like looking around and I look at him and I was like, do you, uh, do you feel something, you know, that, that kind of thing. And then there was another big shutter and like bigger than like, you know, I, I had felt on that thing before. And I'm like, fuck. And then you hear like straight out of Titanic metal twisting and cable snapping and like all this shit. And I'm, and I'm like, oh, fuck, like this is happening. So the, there are three ramps there and they're pretty sizable. So I'm like, I hope nobody's on these fucking ramps. So I sprint. I drop the bottles of wine. Literally, I sprint to the front. There are these two, this, this old couple, the Colellis, Mike and Len, great people that were literally about to make a break for it across this gangplank, which was about the distance of like, I want to say maybe 50 yards, something like that. So it's, it's a sizable walk. Grab them, pull them back towards like where, where the building was. As I did that, this fucking gangplank, this like whole bridge buckled in half, twists and falls into the water. The current's moving. Again, this is March. It was probably like 30 degrees outside, something like that. There's all kinds of debris. It's night. 
I'm a fucking awesome swimmer. I tell you what, like if I had hit that water and you told me like, Hey, go 50 yards to shore, I probably would have struggled. And if I didn't, if, and the other option would have been, I would have drowned let alone like an older couple or anything like that or anybody else. That's not a good swimmer or fuck. I mean, like, and I was in a, everybody's in like dresses and suits and shit, you know, like that buckles. And I'm like, Oh my fucking God. And I'm looking at the shore standing on the, the entry point, right at the entrance of this thing. And then I just start to see the shore just kind of start to slowly move. And I'm like, motherfucker, we're, we're floating, we're moving. Right. So I pick up, I swear to God, I wish I had this uh, phone recording because I called 911. I probably sounded like a just complete crazy person. But I just remember being like, this is Keegan Corcoran, manager of a uh, waterfront restaurant. We broke it free of our moorings. So we're floating downstream. Click. Like, which I'm sure like the 911 operator was like, okay, fucking, I don't know what that prank was all about. That kind of thing. So literally all three, except for like the very last one at one single point of the ramps failed. We floated down, started all of the fucking electric lines, all of the the power lines and the, and the plumbing and everything like that was ripping off of the shore coming off of the poles. And then there, there's this giant pylon from the clay, clay Bailey bridge that literally the restaurant kind of overhanged over the side of the thing, just how, how it was built out. And it was headed straight for these pylons. And by now, like I'm thinking like, it's going to shear off this whole side of the building and take everybody with us. Cause we were mi- moving like a good clip at first me and, and Charlie blood. So the general manager at the time, we just grabbed the entire crowd and we forcibly pushed everybody back. Because we didn't know what the fuck that was going to happen. Then the very last ramp on the last side, it like had twisted and kind of like scooted down and then caught one of the dead man moorings, which are these giant, um, they're literally 10 foot square concrete blocks that, that are sunk in secure with, with uh, steel cables as like a stopgap or as a, a safety precaution. Thankfully grabbed that. And it was like the last thing. And we stopped like feet from, from this like pile on of this bridge. I shit you not. Like if that thing had gotten into open water and like flipped over or whatever it, it would have been real bad so then like we stopped moving i get back a whole hold of somebody now i've got like you know a hundred plus people of the staff and our guests and everything uh okay we can't get off this fucking thing now i get a hold of the, the coast guard coast guard commissioned some like local tugboat that like butted itself to the back end to keep us from floating down even more if that dead man failed and then we had to figure out how to get everybody off we're trying to keep like everybody it was kind of like most of the guests were cool. Some of them, like a couple of them were like sort of freaking out and I get it. And then we're trying to organize the staff to be like, listen, we, we all kind of know the situation, but we got to maintain order because now I'm like fucking, I'm captain of a fucking dinner cruise, let alone manager for a restaurant, right? Like this is the military and you're all going to shut the fuck up and listen more than you ever had. Like, like we've changed gears. Okay. So then like, you know, it's coming out, like I'm getting, my phone is blowing up because it's hit the news now. Uh, there's like, like helicopters and like all of a sudden there's like news vans from the shore, like pointed at the thing. And I'm, my phone's blowing up from all my friends. Are like, we see you on the TV, like wave. And I'm just like, fuck you, man. Like, I got to keep this line clear. Like, stop. Co-. Like, but hi, you know, then we have like, there was a, a cook that like snuck away from like where they were supposed to be to call into the news and say that he was the executive chef and like is trying to give this like harrowing detail of like the entire fucking story. So then I had to like find him and be like, dude, hang up that fucking phone. Like stop lying to the press. Like stop, you know, like what are you doing? So the coast guard and the fire department literally had to lash these giant fucking ladders together and put it out all the way to the edge. And we had like guests and stuff that were kind of freaking out. Like some of the ladies like there who are in high heels and shit like that. And like the way you had to go down, you had to go backwards, right? So and I'm experienced in ladders, so that shit doesn't phase me. So Chris Collinsworth famously, uh, some people would misconstrue this as infamously, but he famously was was like trying to calm like some of the ladies down. He's like, Listen, I'll go down first, I'll go back up, I'll show you that it's safe. Like he was being a just total gentleman, very, very admirable of him. And like he had worked it out with the fire chief and everything like that, former pro athlete. The ladies see a big guy like me going down and coming back up. They know it's safe, blah, blah, blah. And uh, fire chief was like, yeah, sure. Well, he did that. He went all the way down and then they changed it. We can't let you go back up. So then like the media like rammed that story. It was like, Chris went before his wife and like, he, what a pussy. And like, I can't believe like he would do that. What a piece of shit and all this. Like he just got drugged through the mud by all these people that have no fucking clue what they're talking about. But that's probably number one. Food or drink guilty pleasures or anything fast food candy that you know is pretty unhealthy for you, but you just can't help yourself. I'm bad about fast food. I'm, I've been trying to be better lately. I probably haven't had any fast food in about a month, which is really good for me. But it's it's really tough, like especially when I was at uh, Ruby's, like on the road all the time, and even now, you know, I'm in my van a lot, and you know, it's tough 
the convenience is hard to, to knock, but I'm trying to be better. But uh, Wendy's spicy nugs, a good Arby's and cheddar, man. Seasoned curlies are that's number one with a bullet. As far as like drinks go, it's some domestic light beers. All right. So we got uh, three questions uh, left here as we kind of wrap up. So this one we have broken into categories wine recommendations. So things that you think people should be drinking. You got it priced out zero to twenty dollars a bottle, zero to fifty, zero to a hundred, and then over a hundred. Like I said, things that you think somebody who's a avid wine drinker but doesn't know everything. Uh, obviously, that's impossible to know. But stuff outside of what they'd find at their local grocery store. You know, what do you think they should be drinking? You know, when they're looking for a, a bottle of wine. Yeah. So Folds of Honor look for their wines, uh, Cabernet, Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. Really, really nice wines. Uh, the guy that runs actually their uh, Pinot Noir program uh, is a former Navy SEAL. His name's Etienne Terlinden. He also runs this uh, kind of folds into the next category of like 40 to $50 range. Westerly Wines, uh, they make wines out of Santa Barbara. Absolutely killer fruit. I think Santa Barbara is, that's another region that's like really kind of overlooked, I think. It's, or it's at least not, you know, it doesn't get the acclaim that like Napa and Sonoma get naturally or even like Paso Robles, but there's so much good Syrah and Cabernet and Chardonnay and Pinot Noir that's made there. Uh, I think that's there's a lot of value and bang for your buck to be had there. As far as like, let's see, you said 100 plus? Next one's zero to 100. Andrew Will Winery out of Washington is just incredible. Uh, that's represented by my buddies uh, over at Cutting Edge, but it's, it's, they make some incredible, incredible fruit. I'd say anything off of Red Mountain anymore, you know, you're, you're going to be starting to pay the premium closer to that like $100 range. They make some really fantastic fruit out of there. And then what, 100 plus? So changing it up from like still wines here. Uh, if you have the opportunity, and hopefully maybe one day this will be my, I'll, I'll be able to finagle it into my portfolio. But there's a, a, a winery called uh, Klein Constantia out of South Africa. That makes uh, a very, very famous wine called uh, Vinda Constance. And it is so fucking good. It's a dessert wine. It's a botrytized uh, uh, Chenin Blanc uh, and Semillon. It is so good. It's a very, very special wine, near and dear to my heart. And also the uh, you know claim to fame, Napoleon Bonaparte asked for it on his deathbed. So I love the little historical tidbit of that. But if you've had it, you know how damn good it is. If you haven't had it, look for it. Hopefully, look for it in my portfolio sooner than later. What's one book focused on beverage that you think everyone should read? It's hard for me to uh, narrow that down because I've got a veritable li- library in my house, in my home office. But if we want to talk about something that everybody can kind of like grasp and is a very good at least entry point, I'd say The Wine Bible from Karen McNeil is, uh, I'm sure, very frequently uh, mentioned wine bible is a pretty like approachable you know it's it's, it's a good easy read it's something that anybody can grasp at, at all levels like even at the higher levels there's still good tidbits in there of, like you know i'll pick it up every once in a while i've got a very very beat to shit copy you know at my house that you know 15 years ago i was really excited about that and i was you know i i actually took it with me to a couple like international wine trips just so i could like you know read while i'm like driving through these particular places but a lot of the books that i read anymore it's the french atlas of wine but it's a very specific one and i gravitate towards that one because i'm, I'm a big maps guy you know studying maps drawing maps tracing maps all that stuff is a very good way of like making a, a particular place real uh and and getting a feel for what's going on geographically geologically that can influence the final outcome of the wine and the wine styles and what you can expect from the region and once you get a grasp on that it really makes maps and maps map reading a much or a, a very useful tool in exploring wine for those that are looking for books that have some kind of like geographic bent that that have i mean you could say like you know the atlas of wine or whatnot uh, sometimes those those wine maps can get a little convoluted and a little too much information i think i appreciate them for what they are but sometimes too much of a good thing is is not a good thing if you can find books that have maps in them that paint a picture for you in your mind of what can be expected, then that's the book that you should gravitate towards because not everybody reads maps in the same way and not everybody interprets maps in the same way, so to speak. And if you're looking, if you pick up a book and you're looking at maps that within them, and most wine books do have that, and those maps really don't make sense to you. And you're like, they've got regions overlaid with topography, overlaid with, you know, geology and 
wind direction and currents and there's so much shit and I don't even know how to read this fucking thing. Maybe find a book that from that particular region that you want to learn about that doesn't have so much and then you can kind of like scale it, so to speak. And lastly, I'm an Anthony Bourdain fan, but not everybody is or was. If you were, is there a moment, episode, scene that still stands out to you about him? If you weren't, is there anybody else who's on TV? Emeril, Jacques Pepin, Julia Child, somebody who that you kind of gravitated towards? Uh, I am a Bourdain fan. A specific uh, scene, he was, uh, who the hell was he? I think he was like in either like Iceland or Norway or something like that. Anyways, he went to a gym. I don't know if you remember this episode. That, like he went to like the, there are these like bodybuilders or whatever these big like muscle bound dudes like strong men basically and he was going there and like he kept hearing people like he went there because like the the woman that ran the kitchen for the gym for all these like world's strongest men like made this amazing stew or whatever and he sits down and they put four bowls in front of him and he's like I you know I can't eat all this shit and, and the the strong guys are sitting down with him and they're like no it's like one bowl for each of your limbs. Like when you're like working out, like that's the, that's how you, you like recoup or whatever. I can't remember the exact, I wish I could remember the country or the specific place, but I, that always cracked me the fuck up. But huge fan of Jacques Pepin. I, I love, um, you know, happy cooking. You know, I, I love the, uh, uh, I love his old demeanor. It's a dream of mine to, he draw, I have a few of his cookbooks at, at, at my house, but he, he very famously draws these custom menus for, for people like hand, hand paints and whatnot. And it's always been a dream of mine to own one of his menus, like, and just have it framed. I don't know. I just think, I, I think it'd be neat to have as uh, two of my favorites. And then of course, uh, Gordon Ramsay, just cause I love, I love raising hell. So I think uh, sometimes I'll, sometimes I'll throw that on. Just like you fucking donkey, you know, that kind of thing. And I'll laugh for a while and then I'll go back about my work. It's like, okay, I, all right. I got to calm down. Cause I don't want to just pop off at somebody at TJ Maxx and call them that or something. You know what I where can people find you and where can people find some of the wine that you're bringing in? Plug everything, website, social media, all that stuff. Instagram is uh, at Ignition Wines. My personal Instagram account is at Snap Keegan. But I'd say look look to Ignition Wines for more updates on, on wines and, and things in the portfolio and random bullshit that I have uh, have on there. Or you go to uh, uh, ignitionwines.com uh, and there's links, I think, to, to all of that on each one of my, my accounts. So yeah, look for me there. Otherwise, find restaurants and, and bottle shops and, and all that, you know. I'll be popping around the city. And if anybody has any questions, my DMs are open, you know. Like, if you ever, or my, and my email, too. If anybody ever needs advice about shit, even just, hey, what should I what should I be drinking? Hey, what do you think about the Bengals? Hey, uh, what's, uh, you know, what's a good dive bar or restaurant in, in this place? Or, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to France or I'm going to Spain next month. Where should I go? What should I hit? I'm, I'm always always down and open to talk anything fun with anybody are there any places that people can find your the wines that you're bringing in specifically uh restaurants bottle shops jeff ruby's uh, bottle or two are some great places jungle gems we go to cincinnati a couple times a year usually stop off at jungle gems just because they have a pretty big selection and we hit up some wine shops too as well so we'll definitely keep an eye out start uh seeing if we can find some of the stuff that you're bringing in but yeah this was awesome to to finally be able to connect and and do this so stay in touch need anything from us let us know we always try and support everybody as much as we can who comes on the podcast uh, because they support us by coming on and giving us some of their time so good luck with the master exam pulling for you yeah ray thank you so much for your uh for your time and again i appreciate your flexibility making this work man you're anytime you're in town hit me up would love to have a shitty beer with you Big thanks again to Keegan for coming on the podcast. We had some scheduling and rescheduling on his part and then on my part too as well. So glad to finally be able to get him on and chat about his career. You know, he's somebody who's popped up here in Columbus a little bit. You know, he talked about doing the advanced and everything. He's been sitting for the master too. So Greg Stokes, who he knows a little bit, is in kind of that same class too, has been sitting for his master exam too. So um, they're kind of running concurrently with each other going through that process. Uh, they obviously did the event a couple of years ago, the kind of Psalm versus Psalm event too, which they had at Veritas. So that was pretty cool. Um, just kind of making that connection, kind of everybody's connected to somebody sort of deal. So I was able to just, you know, talk wine and kind of a different approach and what he's experienced, you know, going through that stuff and finding how far he wants to push and what he wants to do with his career and everything and, and approaching it from that angle. So 
Uh, also really cool story, as you heard, uh, with a restaurant floating away, essentially. So you can look up the news articles and stuff too on that. Uh, get, if you want more information on kind of that whole process and everything, but it was a pretty awesome story. So we're glad to have been able to kind of capture that and get that recorded and everything. So people can, you know, run back and listen to it or snippet it or, or whatever. So, uh, that was awesome to see, but, uh, yeah, follow him on Instagram at snap Keegan, and then also at ignition wines, any updates or anything, new wines, new locations where you can find their wine, all that stuff will come out through the Instagram as well as the website, which is just ignitionwines.com. You can find us on Instagram too, as well at spoon mob on all the other social medias, but just follow us there. You can follow us on TikTok. We usually drop a little post like the day before of an episode releasing. So you can kind of get a little sneak preview of who the guest is going to be that week. But really, those are the two main places to find us. And then check out the website. We keep that up to date. Just did a big update with a bunch of different people leaving restaurants or opening new concepts or announcing new concepts, stuff like that too as well. A bunch of awards and stuff coming out too. So Fall is a pretty busy time of year, so there's a lot of updates. So we got all that stuff on the website updated. So check that out if you haven't been there recently. You can write in questions, comments, feedback through the website or through uh, email. We're spoonmob at yahoo.com is the email that we have. Make sure to follow, subscribe to the podcast, whatever platform that you use to consume podcasts. But that's it for this week. Appreciate everybody who's been listening. I uh, hope you, everybody had a great Thanksgiving. But, uh, yeah, if you're new, welcome. If you've been here for a while, thank you for your continued support. And uh, continue to help spread the word, continue to support these establishments and businesses that we feature on the podcast from these people. We feel like they're, you know, the best in the industry. So want to be able to support them as much as we can and make sure that they're around for a long time. So everybody gets a chance to experience kind of what they're doing and gets this full story behind it. Because I think that makes a, a big difference or whatever. And you kind of know some background about what they're going for. I think it uh, improves your experience too as well. So that's kind of the motto, the whole goal of kind of what we're doing and highlighting, you know, cool people doing cool stuff. So I always um, appreciate the recommendations appreciate and everything too as well. But again, if for this week, we will talk to you guys next week on Thursday.